Hello and welcome to the Anime Explorations Podcast. My name is Alex. I'm Tora. I'm David. And we have a special guest this week. Let him introduce himself. I am Blaine. All right. Um, Blaine is, if you've listened, if you've been following my podcasting career for quite some time, not only have you heard my voice with David's before, many times before, but you have heard my voice with Blaine's as well back at the Bureau 42 Greatest Science Fiction Film Tournament podcast, where um, plus, I believe I also guested on your um, Marvel. Yeah, the unofficial um, 75 Greatest Marvels Countdown, which if you yeah. weren't part of that podcast for at least 60 to 75 episodes, you're probably still not getting the title right because it was a little convoluted, but. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, now normally what we do um, when we start at the show is we talk about what we're currently watching anime wise, but, but for when we have guests, we instead asked them, hey, when was your first anime you watched and what generally got you into it? Uh, so the first one I watched was Robotech, mostly because I was a morning person and our local TV station had it in the wrong time slot. So most of their Saturday and Sunday morning lineups were designed to start with like the preschoolers and get older. And Robotech was aimed at about 15 year olds because it was about selling the model building kits. They had it in the time slot for five year olds. So I would get up early. I would watch Max the 2000 year old mouse and the little clowns of happy town because there was only one station that was on at the time. Cause I'm that old. And then Robotech would start at five and I was loving it. I would like the serialized storytelling, which was not available for most of the shows aimed at my age. And as far as I'm concerned, it ended on a cliffhanger because if those who know, who've seen Robotech, it follows basically three generations of, of humans fighting a certain threat. And in the first, cause it was actually like a Frankenstein type show made from three completely independent anime. Um, but yeah, I got hooked on it. And then I think it's about 18 episodes in, or it must've been an odd number of episodes in where a, a character's father figure blows up in a very Roy yeah raw, large fireball. <laughs> So it's basically, as, as far as this orphan is concerned, it's like he's just watched, he's lost his third parent and probably his final one. Wait. Mr. Roy doesn't die. It's the, the jet he was in explodes. It was. No. Oh, well, okay. I'm going to take a different character because Roy dies. Yeah. Okay. During his okay. days. And, <laughs> in any event, the, the character <laughs> dies quite violently and it cut to commercials normally after that saying Robotech will be back after a few minutes. Only it never came back. We got 43 minutes of commercials after that. And then the next day there was another show of the time slot. How <laughs> dare so I'm thinking they had it in that five-year-old time slot. Five-year-olds were watching it. And then this guy dies violently and the phone call started and that show went away and never came back. So I didn't actually finish watching Robotech until I watched it on DVD. Mm. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> I mean, a very similar thing happened to Mobile Suit Gundam during its original airing in the U.S., which was it started in the summer of 2001, despite being a show from 1979. And, uh, you know, it didn't get aired on... September 11th, 2001. They just did not air that episode and it never came back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, there's a number of reasons for this, but primarily Cartoon Network didn't want to have to air it originally and they just took the excuse. <laughs> because it's a show about war. Big old terrorist attack happened. As a kid, mm -hmm. though, the betrayal. <laughs> like, how dare they? <laughs> Yeah, I, I will never forget that morning, and I know it was 43 minutes because I was waiting for commercials to, to start to run to the bathroom, and after that happened, it's like, I do not want to miss a second. I'm going to hold it till the show is done, and it did not come back. No! <laughs> oh, no! no! Oh, no! <laughs> oh. 
thing. I remember a similar sense of horror when I learned that Reboot was over and not getting continued. Because <laughs> the last season ends on a cliffhanger. <laughs> I was young enough to, to just scream at the world. Like, why? <laughs> I need to know how the story ends. <laughs> Yeah, I remember finding out, oh, oh, there's movies! Oh, they came out with movies afterwards! You just turned the final season into three movies! That's not a continuing! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the joy of, of direct-to-video compilation movies, which we'll end up talking about at some point for other things. That actually did happen for Gundam, though the context there was very different. That um, was theatrically released. Yes, those were theatrically released. Um, and also they were meant to finish things out a little bit because Gundam got truncated considerably because, uh, the toys were garbage, the original toys. Oh, yeah. And then they but put they together... good enough to, to keep the show going. Well, what happened is, is the, it did well on reruns. Bandai picked up the model kit rights for Dirt Cheap, um... And then they put out the movies, and that did well enough to finance putting out the movies, and then that allowed for a bunch more seasons of the show, and the rest is history. And now it's an empire. <laughs> Indeed. Um, we think so, I'm so uh, yeah. So, I, so this week we are doing a double feature. Um, we are doing two films, uh, My Neighbor Totoro from Studio Ghibli and Akira um, from Studio Madhouse. Totoro directed by Hayao Miyazaki and uh, Akira directed by Katsuhiro Otomo. Both films made in 1988. So we're starting off with Totoro. Um, quick notes on my first experience with this. Um and also on the history of the film itself. Toto was originally released in a double feature um, alongside the film Grave of the Fireflies. Grave of the Fireflies was screened first, and then Toto was screened after. Um, Theaters quickly learned to not reverse this order. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the my experience, first experience watching it was also in a double feature um, with a uh, high school anime club. We did a anime film screening in our school's conventional theater. Uh, put a screen up and put on the movie and sold snacks as a fundraiser. Um, and we did Totoro first, and then we did for our second film, we did uh, Princess Mononoke. Uh, this was on a weekend. Um, we did, the plan was to do Totoro as our during the day matinee for the kids, and then Mononoke later in the evening for the grown-ups and older teenagers. Not a lot of people showed up for, except for like our family members showed up for Totoro. Everybody showed up for Mononoke, including lots of parents with their kids. Um, but I enjoyed watching the film. We watched it subbed. I later picked up the movie from the library on DVD and watched it with my family with the English dub. With This is the Disney English dub. Um, this film has also, uh, the Disney dub is the second dub that was produced. The first was put out by Streamline Pictures, who will talk about a bit later again with Akira for Japan Airways flight and on one of these flights a guy by the name of Lloyd Kaufman saw the film and his company his film distribution company was starting up a children's label uh, and he wanted to do pick up the English dub of the film for distribution now if you look, hear the name Lloyd Kaufman and rings a bell that's because his film distribution company is Troma um, and they'd started a children's distribution line for handling things like the Toxic Crusaders animated series um, and home video releases of that. So we can thank Toxie for getting the, for this movie getting its original U.S. release. Um, it later got picked up and redubbed by Disney, which brought in a all-star cast um, later on after John Lasseter basically mended a lot of U.S. Japanese fences, distribution fences with um, Miyazaki himself. And that's and that dub, if we, those of us watched it, uh, the English dub, probably the version that we watched today, or watched for this uh, podcast. So 
first question I guess to ask would be, which um, audio track did you watch it with? Both. <laughs> I watched both. Um, I grew up watching this film as a child. Um, we rented it from our local video rental store back when those were a thing. Um, and I, I specifically had my parents read this film over and over. I don't remember how old I was when I first watched it, but I was young. Um, I was born in 86. And so this film is very dear to my heart. It, I consider it kind of one of my formative films. Um, and if we can go back to Robotech for a second, Carl Masek of Robotech fame is the one who adapted <laughs> the film for the original Streamline dub. He, he gets a little uncredited uh, voice work in the original dub as well, doing some stuff for Cat Bus. Um, and so I did watch I did watch both dubs back to back. I watched the Streamline one first, which is the one I grew up with, and then I watched the Disney one on streaming. Actually, I think we have the DVD. We do. Anyway, um, <laughs> I have I have a lot of comments on on the two dubs, but I mean realistically, if you're looking at watching this movie for the first time, and I think you should, this movie is slept on. Um, the dubs are both fine. <laughs> I will always prefer the Streamline Pictures dub, the original dub, because I grew up with it. And I also think that it is, it is objectively better, and I can explain why later if that's something you're interested in, but the Disney one is fine. <laughs> perfectly serviceable, but listening to it, you can really tell that while they got an all-star cast, they got an all-star cast of film actors and not voice no, actors. Actor. And there's a lot of difference between those two styles of performances. Uh, we'll say they did get Frank Welker, and he is just, just always a treat, even if he's just doing animal noises. The man is fantastic. But to Totoro's world is a world of kind of heightened realism, magical realism, and so it is better suited for traditional voice acting or even like music, musical theater style voice acting where the affect and the drama is more pronounced. I feel like in a Disney dub, the actors and actresses are just kind of talking mm -hmm. as opposed to really acting and emoting, um, and it doesn't serve the film as well. And they made some word changes to the translation in the Disney version that I don't know why they did. I don't agree with. Um, and they made it more grounded and less wondrous and magical. And I really don't, I really don't appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I prefer the original, the original dub. Okay. Cool. I, I suspect the Disney dub is the only one I've heard. I only heard one dub. But with I guess is the other one isn't available anymore. Yeah, we had to track it down. Yeah, I've got the um, Disney DVD and it had Pat it? Carroll and Tim Daly in the cast, so that yeah. you know when you've got uh, Pat Carroll is not as well known now. She's probably best known for being Ursula in The Little Mermaid. So, and Frank Welker was a part of it, and like we said, Tim Daly, who um, he's a great he, he is a great Superman. Some people know him from Wings. I. Yeah, I really enjoyed him. I just wish people hadn't laughed at the Emmys when he talked about when he was playing Superman. People thought it was a joke, and it wasn't. And I'm pretty sure that's why he chose not to renew his contract and continue playing Superman on Justice League and why it passed yeah. to George Newbern. Because it would have been... That Emmy ceremony was right... That was the last season he did. So people didn't even know he was doing the work. I could see him being concerned about getting more work if people thought... Well, if they didn't know what he was doing, maybe they thought he wasn't working anymore. And that's not a good thing for an actor to be going through. So. Yeah. Um, there are a few like non-voice actors in the Japanese dub. Um, Miyazaki likes to cast stage actors and some screen actors in favor of Japanese voice actors. Though there is this particular instance of one very non-actor at all in the role of Mei and Sasuke's father, Tatsuo. Um actor by the name of Shigesatu I'm not an actor, but a person by the name of Shigesatu Itoi. Um, I don't know if either of you are familiar with that name. It sounds familiar. 
Uh, are you heard? I've heard of the game Earthbound. Yes, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> he wrote Earthbound and the like all three games in the series. Mother, uh, Mother Two or Earthbound is released in North America, and Mother Three. He is known as a writer, um, just in general writing, also for writing. Um, basically like advertising pitch um, tagline phrases and that sort of thing. He is known for having a, doing a very good job of drawing a particular emotional reaction, um, or emotional response with very um, concise okay, writing. So, so the father um, in this movie is played by the father and mother. Yes. <laughs> that, that is correct. Um, nice. So like he is a, not actor. Um, I I watched this with the Japanese dub. I think he does an okay job, an all right job, all things considered. Um, I don't. Uh, it. I will say he does have the problem of his performance is certainly very understated. Um, for this in the Japanese dub, which I think fits with the the, the problem with casting um, regular screen actors or stage, but well, less less so less stage actors where it is can be tricky for them to up their perform to embellish their performance in a way that work that's necessary for doing animation and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're um, going from this, the plot, um, and kind of the, the setting of itself. This is kind of the movie that I think sort of sets up the, establishes the, the concept in terms of fandom. That's something of the Ghibli countryside. Uh, very, this is, it's a very pastoral, very, um, green verdant film. Um, it's something where for when, like, whenever I see anime anymore, these day after this, trying to evoke the Japanese countryside, they're very clearly trying to draw elements out from Totoro and how, um, this film depicts the Japanese countryside. Um, there has been some great, um, life influencing art which then influences life again um, in terms of the forests that Miyazaki used as inspiration for the countryside in Totoro um, was saved from development efforts by fans of the film and is now kind of a protected nature reserve which I think is pretty cool uh, so what did you think about the, like, the, the characters and the narrative setting of this in terms of a very Deliberately, very consciously Japanese, because most of Miyazaki's work previous to this had been um, like sort of Mediterranean Europe, like with, uh, or Mediterranean Europe inspired, like with um, Castle of Cagliostro and his work on Lupo the uh, Third, or um, with Castle in the Sky, or in the case of the series he'd worked on immediately prior to this in his last animated anime series he did, um, uh, Future Boy Conan, uh, post apocalyptic. Uh, how did you feel about the setting of this in terms of how it worked um, worked out for you, the, the presentation of it? Well, I think the setting was required for this story. You need to have a large amount of land to travel, especially when one of the girls is missing and the whole town is looking for her. You need a huge space to have that happen while still making sure you can feel personal and they've got the, the close neighbors, you've got the friends you have to have the variety of terrains and the forest there so that they can have the adventures with, with Totoro and find elements that others couldn't find. It was a perfect setting. And this, you'll hear people say like, sometimes the setting is another character. Like, you know, as a sci-fi fan, the classic is the enterprise is part of the cast on Star Trek. This, that is more true of the forest here than it is of the enterprise on Star Trek. It is, an mm -hmm. integral setting to this plot. The only thing I'm trying to sort out is why the particular hospital their mother is in because she needs specialized care is more of a rural hospital than an urban hospital. But maybe it's not because the care is that specialized. Maybe it's just that's where she was and they don't want to move her. So I, it it doesn't ruin the form the the film for me because I can think of reasons why it would play out that way. But that was the only possible snag in the setting. The film is kind of semi-autobiographical in that uh, Miyazaki took that experience of a parent being in the hospital um, because his mom was in the hospital for tuberculosis when he was a boy. 
Um, and he's, he's gone out and when he talks about this film, I mean, when he talks about any of his films, but this film in particular, he likes to give like different and contradictory answers to questions across the years because he'd prefer that you kind of make up your own mind and because he is a grumpy old curmudgeon of a man. Um, but he, he's, he's, he's gone on record and said that, yeah, this film is semi autobiographical. It draws a lot on his own experiences. If he had tried to do this film, he said, with boys as the protagonists instead of girls, he wouldn't have been able to do it because it would have been too personal and too emotional for him. Someone said to him once that Sotsky's character, like no child that good could ever exist in terms of like, she's so dutiful and helpful and good hearted. And he said back, uh, no, those children absolutely do exist. I was that child. So a lot of that is taken from personal experience. Um, the other thing you have to remember is that this movie is very much a foil to Grave of the Fireflies or almost an inversion. The two films were being developed at the same time. Um, and so both of them were set in Japan, both of them set in the post-war era. But the way I've heard it said by smarter critics than myself is that Grave of the Fireflies is what happened in the horrific kind of war and post-war era, whereas the world of Totoro is what could have happened or what Miyazaki hopes would have happened instead. Um, so there are some scenes in Grave of the Fireflies that are mirrored in Totoro, but the vibe is completely different. There's a scene in Grave where the kids are running through their house and they're doing it because their house is being bombed and it ends up getting set on fire. In Totoro, the kids are running through the house and it's a scene of like joyful exploration, right? So there are a couple of these kind of mirrors that happen. So if you do watch the films back to back, Grave of the Fireflies is very realistic and painful almost to watch. And then Totoro is almost kind of like a warm hug. It's a very healing movie and it, it kind of addresses the trauma of the post-war era in a, in a approach of healing and regrowth and new life. It's hard to look at it outside of that context now for me, but when I was a kid, obviously I was just like, oh, this is so cool, you know? <laughs> This, this landscape is beautiful and I want to run around in it. Miyazaki and art director Kazuo Oga had discussions about the look of the film. And they actually argued because Kazuo Oga like, did the dirt one color from his home prefecture. And then Miyazaki was like, why is the dirt this color? It should be this color from my home prefecture. That sense of welcome and home and a place that you want to dive into and explore, I think is very important to the film as a whole. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to edit myself. I could say so much about this movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I do definitely agree with this, uh, with this, particularly the sentiment of this film as being a warm hug. It definitely fits with the, this film also coming second in the viewing order because it makes that sense of, one and you've watched this movie like and you come out of the end of Grave of the Fireflies, which as a minor spoiler for Grave of the Fireflies, because this is the opening shot of the film, uh the two kids in Grave of the Fireflies die of malnutrition and starvation. And then the rest of the film is a flashback to how it came to this. Um it is meant to be a it's based on a novel and it's meant to be a very strong anti war film. Um, but it's one that has a very, again, it's, it's, it's saying up front, this is, this is going to be a tragedy and brace yourself for that. Um, and then by contra contrast, my neighbor Totoro is, um, again, warm, fluffy. Totoro is a very fluffy character. Um, big hug. And it makes for a interesting thing also on its own, um, particularly in context with the relate contrast with a lot of Miyazaki's other work. It's interesting to see how this film kind of heavily, is heavily weighted perception in the U S and elsewhere where we didn't necessarily see it in that context of that original double feature um, of 
Miyazaki as a creator. Most people tend to, I think, view Miyazaki as a director in the context of Totoro and Spirited Away, films which are very, very kid friendly. Also, like light, like light to no peril, real, really in them, um, compared to stuff like uh, Castle in the Sky like uh, Castle of Cagliostro, like um, Princess Mononoke, or even uh, or even um, uh, Porco Rosso, which are films which... Porco Rosso doesn't have much peril in it, but has a bit more either grumpiness or a little more... Not edges is the wrong term, but like there's action, there's violence, there's death, um, and peril to them. Whereas this, like, no, this is this is... Something fluffy. There is moments of the like, degree of emotional intensity, but there's nothing like really like with the really scary in this. Um, where the rest of you are parents, how did you feel about watching this with your kids, or if you, if you watch it with your kids, and how did they handle? How did they take the film? Um, I. Yeah. Oh my gosh! So <laughs> <laughs> I I had. Mm. I've, been trying, I've been trying to get my kid to watch this movie with me from like before he was old enough for it probably because I was just so eager to share it I had an amazing parenting moment just the other day when I was watching the Disney version and Luke is like drawing something at the table on the other side of the room and I was like well, Totoro's about to show up get over here at the beginning of the sequence where May is following the acorn trail and he, his attention is caught by the little white Totoro, and he comes over and he starts watching. And he is in. Like, from the moment the little white one appears, he is in it, and we are enjoying it together. <laughs> when Big Totoro shows up and May pats him on the nose, and his whiskers fluff up, like, in irritation because she's, like, scratching his nose. That's, like, my favorite clip of animation of all time, by the way. Luke, like, audibly gasped out loud in delight. And so did I. I was like, yes! Like, <laughs> during the sequence where they're raising up the big tree, he was throwing up his arms to mirror the motion of the characters on the screen, just like I did when I was a kid. I'm so emotional about it, you guys. <laughs> we get to the end of the film, he's like, that's it? <laughs> yeah, what happened to That was too short! <laughs> Like, well, you did start watching part of the film. Well, go back to the beginning. Yeah, we start watching again. Um, but the, watching the film as a parent, it hits very differently. Oh my god! It, it hits so differently. Um, you know, things that I didn't give a second thought about when I was watching it as a kid, I'm now watching it like, Dad is moving them into this house. This house is falling apart. Dad, what are you thinking? Like. <laughs> <laughs> there's that moment when the wind is hitting the house and they're all kind of freaking out about it. And Dad is like, at first he's like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. And then this particularly strong gusts hit and the entire house rattles and Dad's face is like, oh, crap. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel for the dad in the film. He is going through it. Um, they all are. <laughs> One, yeah. one of the best things that Miyazaki does is his meticulous observation and recreation of children's behavior. Like, I don't think anyone would argue with me on this, that the children in his films act more like children than kids in any other movie ever. Like, <laughs> animation or live action, even. Um, so, things will happen that I originally saw from a child's perspective that I now see from an adult's perspective. Like, when May jumps on her sleeping father and says, wake up! I have now been both the child and the parent in that scenario. <laughs> Beautiful little parallel there, because she jumps on her dad while he's asleep, and then a couple scenes later, she does the same thing to the big Totoro. So, giving him kind of gentle parental vibes right from the get-go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think the film is is really enchanting and the fact that the that the like physical peril doesn't necessarily exist until the final part of the movie i think makes that final part of the movie more anxiety inducing 
like, even as a kid, I felt like that sequence where Satsuki is running by herself looking for her sister. Like, as a kid, I was already primed to empathize with Satsuki because I have three younger siblings and I identified a lot with Satsuki as kind of the caretaker, like, third parent, older sibling. Um, and so even as a kid, that gave me a lot of anxiety and, and you know, emotional, <laughs> emotional damage. Uh, mm-hmm. But as a parent, actually, I feel like that sequence goes on even longer. Um, and the bit with, you know, the sandal getting found and they're starting to dredge the canals as a parent, the anxiety is just tip top, right? But then when I watched it with Luke, I timed out. Like, the length of time between when May goes missing and wait, when, when Satsuki goes to Totoro to find her. And it's actually not that long at all. <laughs> it feels so much longer than it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just, you know, like, I'm, I'm in it with my feelings. So I have a hard time looking at it objectively. David, I think you had a harder time connecting to the movie, seeing it as an adult, because yeah, uh, I you're just it. like, nothing is happening. And then in the final third of the film, it's like suddenly something happens, and you're like, okay. <laughs> I did not watch this film until I was in college, when my then-girlfriend uh, showed it to me. <laughs> yeah, her now. Uh, we got married. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I do didn't connect to it on that you know, emotional as a child level, but coming back to it as a parent, uh, yeah, definite, definite feelings. Narratively, I think it's kind of weak, but emotionally, it's just so damn fulfilling that I'm willing to forget I, a lot of I would agree with that. Loss. My first exposure to this was earlier this week. So, yeah, it's been sitting in a drawer for far too long, just Purchased Beauty. off Miyazaki's reputation. Uh, I did not watch it with our toddler. I watched it while she was at daycare. Right now, uh, she's yeah, she's two and a half. <laughs> so far, the only thing longer than twenty minutes without musical numbers that she will watch is Columbo. Um, <laughs> yeah, she'll watch Columbo start to finish. She'll get over half an hour into original Star Trek. But she'll keep asking me when Kirk's going to sing Oh, What a Fight, because that was her first exposure to Star Trek. Uh, If you haven't seen that YouTube video, check it out. Star Wrecked (laughs) did a parody of Oh, What a Night, December 1963, Mm -hmm. about the Star Trek episode Arena, where Kirk fights the Gorn. But, yeah. Uh, Back to this. uh, Yeah, you're thinking of mock time. No, that's... That's a mock time. But I I had a similar experience to David where... It feels like a slow start because I am used to family or children's films being plot driven, right? Often with very one dimensional character archetypes plugged in so that they can go straight to the plot. And this is not that this is a character piece aimed at young children, which they could enjoy. But um, I will certainly show this to my daughter long before Akira, but you, you do have to be. Yeah, you do have to reach a a stage of maturity where you are ready for that character piece. Because yeah, if you're if you're looking for plot driven, that's Act Three. That's not Acts One and Two. The first two acts are it's almost like Act One is building the setting. Act Two is establishing the relationships, and then Act Three things move. And I, I mean, you say it's a warm hug. That is clear on repeat viewings. My first time through, I didn't know if they were going to do like a bridge to Terabithia thing when the mother is sick, the younger daughter is missing. I was sitting there going, is everyone going to make it through this? I'm still not sure everyone did make it through this because they did find a sandal floating in a lake. It wasn't her sister's, but it was someone's. Whose was it? Where is that child right now? Are they on the bottom of a canal somewhere? (laughs) No. There was um there is a really big fan theory that goes around and it kind of resurfaces whenever this movie is talked about that the movie is actually about a schoolgirl murder that happened and that Totoro is a death god and that the girls don't survive the end of the movie. Studio Ghibli actually came out and debunked this. Um but it is a kind of a persistent and popular 
um, interpretation of the film. Miyazaki hates it. Uh, <laughs> I don't get it. It's like, how can you go into this film with that viewpoint? I think it both overcomplicates and oversimplifies the film, right? It overcomplicates it because people are looking for all of this quote-unquote evidence to support the death god theory. And it oversimplifies it because the human relationships that are present in the movie are very simple, but also very profound. And if you want to read a darkness into the movie, I mean, you can, that's your prerogative. But I think it kind of belies the spirit of what the film is about, which is a hopefulness. Yeah. Um, there was a Japanese anthropologist who wrote a little bit about this movie, and he talked about how when the children are raising up the big tree in front of their house, it, for one thing, literally shelters and protects their father and their house. But on another viewing, the tree rises up into the shape of a mushroom cloud. So Miyazaki took the symbol of his generation's greatest collective trauma and repurposed it into a symbol of life and hope. And I think that's kind of the underlying theme of the movie, if you look at it with all of the cultural context, which of course you don't have to. <laughs> all interpretations are valid. Um, but I, I lean toward the opinion that um, the Death God interpretation is, is false because the movie is not about death in the final analysis. It's about life and hope. And... Uh, yeah. Things could be better, you know? Yeah, if anything, the Totoro over there is guardian angels to prevent death. Like, the, the death god interpretation, when you said that, mm -hmm. I was thinking of the meme that they stuck Carl Sagan's face on. I don't know if it's his quote or not, but the that's a wonderful hypothesis you've got there. Be a shame if someone were to test it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very uh, persistent theory. Um, but it, I think it, it almost sounds like it deliberately misunderstands the core of the film for people who it, are saying, no, it, not everything is happy-go-lucky and trying to take something that, that's happy and warm and fuzzy and say, it's not really that, because that's not the world, and I need the world to be as dark as my soul. Yeah, it, that it, that's people bringing their own views into it and not letting the work stand on its own. And frankly, that's nonsense, because this film does stand on its own. I have problems with it, but I'll, I've watched it I don't know how many times by this point. I've talked about this movie with a lot of people and read about a lot of people's experiences with it. When kids watch it, they kind of come into one of two camps. One camp of kids is um, they think it's too slow and they don't watch it. But the majority of kids get totally absorbed by it, including um, a lot of kids with uh, spectrum disorders, because it has so much room to immerse yourself in it and to breathe. There are so many shots where it's just like you see a snail crawling up a blade of grass, you see clouds moving across the sky. I, I found this so absorbing as a child, and I, I feel like I could live in that world almost. And it is in stark contrast to most children's movies, especially at the time, where they felt like they had to grab our attention with a million things on screen at any given moment. Like, this is what's happening now. This is what's happening now. This is what's happening now. As opposed to letting it breathe. <laughs> Keep in mind, this came out the same year as Little Mermaid, like the start of the quote-unquote Disney renaissance. And totally different approaches to children's animation. Um... Just yeah, the year before, the totally actually. Different Little Mermaid was 89, different. 88 I was, think, yeah. uh, might have made it to North America in, 80, in 89, mm -hmm. but the big release for kids in this year was Who Framed Roger Rabbit? That is not a kid's movie. Yeah. Such a uh, movie. Beetle <laughs> That's so important to focus through. Yeah, Beetlejuice came out this so year, too. So, yeah. <laughs> Also, not a kid's movie. <laughs> the fact that there was a Beetlejuice kids TV show just confused me even as a child. Well, can keep in mind the Beetlejuice the kids TV show like premiered a couple okay, years okay. after well, the Rambo and Robocop kids cartoons. So, 
I remember RoboCop, the TV show, and I was like, this is... Like, I saw it as a kid way before I saw RoboCop. And I'm like, this is... This is not right. <laughs> yeah, like, I think um, there's a couple of reasons why Totoro has been Studio Ghibli's mascot, you know, essentially ever since. Um, first, the design is great. But, but second, because I think he is kind of emblematic of Miyazaki's entire style of storytelling in terms of what I was talking about before. <laughs> Kind of the hopefulness of the movie. Mm-hmm. I hesitate to put words in Miyazaki's mouth, though, because he is, he's a contrary, grumpy old man. Um, that, that's true, but he... He will give a different answer. Yes, he will. Well. So. Well, uh, it, it helps, to a certain degree, from the figure out his intent and stuff, that he has, a lot of his writings have been collected and published in books. Yes. Um, like, this is... Uh, he... I was watching some of the making of documentaries on this. He mentioned that he was working on a, when he was starting the production process for this, he was finishing up work on an anime series, which again, I believe timeline wise would be, um, the, uh, uh, future boy Conan, uh, series. And like Miyazaki, this is something from his writings, as opposed to things he said in interviews. He hates television animation. Like he hates, he hated working in it. He hated the compromises he had to do for this. And like this, even more than the films that came before, really showcases the way animation as um, Miyazaki wants it to be in contrast with television animation. Miyazaki considers television animation and stuff related to it to be anime, and that he does is just animation. And he like he he, he, he really hates the compromises. He he even hates for a while hated manga because it he felt it it caused people to um it, it trained audiences into the mental shorthand needed to accept the compromises made for television animation in terms of the, the cuts and that sort of thing um and it does fit with like his directorial style now like miyazaki has a very it, the movie comes out when it's done and not one second when i say it's done and not one second before which is why with with the the boy and the heron its Japanese release was basically him dropping the movie into the, into theatrical release, more or less with no hype, like Beyonce dropping an album on streaming service. The most major flex. <laughs> but when you look at Totoro, you know, he was having to deal with a lot of compromises. This film wouldn't have been able to get made if they hadn't double billed it with Grave of the Fireflies. Um, Grave of the Fireflies was basically what got them the funding because it was based on a novel. Um, they didn't think Totoro would be profitable at all. So he, the, uh, Ghibli had to co-make the two films at the same time. Eight animators worked on Totoro and they finished the film in eight months while simultaneously working on Grave of the Fireflies. The story went through a lot of changes. Like originally it was just going to be one little girl protagonist, which is why on the poster for the film, it's just one little girl who looks like a mixture of Satsuki and Mei. <laughs> that's also why they, they both end up being named they as kind of a nod to the fact that um, it was originally supposed to be one character Satsuki is an old Japanese word for Mei so the girls are Mei and Mei um, <laughs> the, the third act of the film where there's drama I think originally was not even going to be there the film was originally supposed to be a lot shorter um, so honestly it's a wonder that it was made at all and that it was made to the standard with, with, with which it exists <laughs> I think a lot of that comes down to Kazuo Oga, the art director, um, who is an incredible artist. Just cannot say enough good things. Um, But yeah, and then Totoro didn't actually do that well until it came out on home video, which is when it really took off. And And also... And when it be shown on TV in Japan. Yeah, it also, like, not just shown on TV, is it was shown regularly on, like, one of the major cable networks basically the same way that um tnt or tbs would every year on thanksgiving show um wizard of oz um it had a a similar like major home get the family together for the holidays circulation um broadcast uh window and that helped build up that fan base um before we wrap up our our um our general total discussion 
Um, soundtrack by Joe His- uh, Hisashi. Um, what do you think about that? Lives rent free in my head, constant. Every time I'm out in nature and I see something particularly inspiring, the music, the camphor tree theme starts playing in my brain. <laughs> uh, Joe is really an amazing composer. Obviously, refined his craft over the years. Um, but there's something about the Totoro soundtrack that I feel is more. How do I want to put this? It feels more Japanese, more authentically Japanese. I feel like he kind of expands a little bit and, and gets away from that feeling. But I also think that's intentional. Does that make sense? Yes. To me. <laughs> I know how your brain works. You know how my brain works. Um, but if you compare it to Mononoke, which is more epic, or to... Um, Gosh, my brain just blipped. Or to Howl's Moving Castle, which is more fairy tale. I think the he really is able to tailor his music to fit the film. And so this film's themes of nature and Shinto animism, I, I think, come out in the music. And I love it. I love it so much. I have one more thing I want to talk about before we move on. I'm so sorry. I have volumes. Uh <laughs> And that is, I think this film is so popular across the world because it has an amazing blend of Japanese mythology and Western fairy tale mythology. So there are obvious allusions to Alice in Wonderland, right? You got the, the cat bus, Cheshire cat smile. Miyazaki denies being influenced by Alice in Wonderland for the design of the cat bus, but um, yeah, it could be one of those normal kinds of cat bus. <laughs> Like, sure, Bakaneko, I get that, but also. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, you have May falling down. On the cat. <laughs> you have May falling down a hole into a magical place, like Alice falls down a hole into Wonderland. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's a hard to find detail, but at the end of the movie, when you get almost an epilogue in the little vignettes that they're showing after the credits of the mom finally coming home, you see that she's reading the girls, uh, the three Billy Goats Gruff story. And Totoro is a mispronunciation of Tororu, which is troll, as they would say it in Japanese. So that's why May calls him Totoro. And she was referring to the troll in the story of the three Billy Goats Gruff. And there's a beautiful inversion in the movie, because in the story of the three Billy Goats Gruff, you got the three Billy Goats and the bad troll. But in Totoro, you have the three Totoros, the three trolls, and one mean goat. If you remember that one scene where the goat is trying to eat her corn. <laughs> so I love that. Um, and there, the references to Japanese folklore, of course, are many. Um, there is a figure in Japanese folklore called Inari, who is a really popular god. Um, and he's often shown with a sword in one hand and a bag of rice in the other. And he has... Um, kitsune fox spirits that follow him. And so May actually finds a shrine to Inari in the movie that's full of those little kitsune shrines. And Totoro is almost in Inari parallel, but instead of a sword and a bag of rice, he has an umbrella and a pouch of seeds, which I think is really cute. <laughs> so there's a lot of different cultural elements that went into the movie, um, but they all they all fade into the background as they should and make one kind of cohesive harmony, the kind of heightened magical realism of this. Mm-hmm. It's grounded yet whimsical. I love it. <laughs> Can't say enough good things about this movie. I have a couple more random facts if you want them. Ah, <laughs> uh, um, any final thoughts from um, you, Blaine? First of all, I'm uh, happy that you uh, invited me to to be that kick in the pants to actually get around to watching it because you know my collection is much bigger than it should be of unwatched films. So yeah, th- this is delightful. This is one I look forward to sharing with my daughter when I think she will sit through it long enough to get into it. Because as we said, it starts off as a, a slow character piece. Um, yeah, the visuals are a huge part of the storytelling, so you don't need dialogue at a lot of the time, which I think helps because I watched it with the dub and subtitles on, and they don't match very well. 
they are often saying entirely different things at any given time. Um, See, so yeah, I think at one at some point I will. That yeah, it's it's not as extreme as <laughs> the uh, the Final Fantasy anime I have. That's the twenty five episode anime. Um, uh, no, I don't have case? Legend of the Crystals. I didn't or realize it was VHS only when I chose not to buy it when I saw it because the DVDs were just coming out for other things and it has never been released since. But yeah, that, that one is the direct sequel to Final Fantasy V with the children of Barts and Lena as the lead characters with two 45 minute chapters released on two VHS tapes. The Final Fantasy anime is a 25 episode series that starts off painfully, painfully slow and a Apparently, from what I've seen, it doesn't really get good until the second half when they were told, yeah, you pitched us a 75-episode show, but it's not very popular. We committed to 25, and that's it, so wrap up your story. So when they squeeze the last 62 episodes worth of story into 12 episodes and the pace picks up, apparently that's when it gets good. I haven't pushed myself that far yet. But, yeah, this this is one that can be shared with the family. You just... Uh, because... It is so visual and it is so character driven and not plot driven. I would say you have to be ready to sit down and devote your attention to it. Do not multitask with this film or you will not be able to appreciate it the way it's meant to be appreciated. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Our other movie that we did for a double feature, also from 1998, is Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira. Um, picked this one partially because it's one of the and un, most popular anime films that came out this year, and it's rarely accessible. But also, it's was, I think, a lot of people's, to a certain degree, also Totoro, but this in particular, gateway anime. Um, it is a film which is different in a lot of, like, both films are different in a lot of respects from Western animation. We've talked about Totoro, its willingness to be a slower character piece, and that sort of thing. Um, Akira is one that's willing to be more mature in multiple aspects of that term. Um, and also it's, like, a by contrast, Totoro is very pastoral, slow-paced, um, and Akira is very metropolitan, um, it's widely considered to be very heavily influential on the cyberpunk movement as much as Ghost in the Shell and Blade Runner were. Having recently replayed cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and it's a very intense, it's, it's a very intense film. Um, my first time watching it was actually bits and pieces of it on the site when it aired on the sci-fi channel. Oh yeah. Um, and I wasn't able to watch all of it at the time because when I was when it came out, my dad was working in a job repairing television, so he didn't like having TVs on during the day because he had to watch them, had them on so much at work. So I wasn't able to watch the whole movie. So the parts I saw was um, the scene on the bridge and the parts leading up to that. Um. And then later I eventually got the movie on the Pioneer DVD release from the library and then eventually ended up just buying it multiple releases myself. Um, so I know that this is Back Blaine's first time, time watching it because I but got the, him his the, copy. The first time was 27 years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> and See, only vaguely remembered. Yeah. Um, my first time watching this, I came in partway through. Uh, yeah, I, I still distinctly remember I was on a trip. I was in a hotel room. Uh, I turned on the TV. I was like, oh, they got the sci fi channel. I flipped over and I got at the first scene I saw was Tetsuo in the hospital being attacked by the, <laughs> by the, the teddy bear, the. Rabbit and the car. And that... WTF did I just watch? <laughs> it was like, what the... What is going on? <laughs> like, eventually, you know, I, yeah, 
I came back and watched it from the beginning because this is back when okay. Sci-Fi was airing it like every week. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, so and, this came out in '88. Um, this is Otomo's first full film that he directed. Um, he had done several short films prior to this. He had done the framing narrative sequence from the film um, Robot Carnival, and he'd done the short Order to Stop Construction for the anthology film um, Labyrinth Tales, also released in the United States after Akira came out as Neo Tokyo, um, which we talked about on a previous episode of the podcast when I saw it at a film festival in town. Um and he'd done a little bit of anim key animation work on the movie Harmageddon, um, released in Japan as Genma Wars. So he, he'd gotten his feet wet, but he hadn't been as heavily involved in animation as um, uh, Miyazaki was when he did Totoro. So this is like and this is a, this is his first film, the first time actually doing like full length direction. Um, uh, another thing worth noting about Otomo and this film is that this he is adapting a manga work that he didn't finish writing until after he finished the movie. Yep. And uh, as an adaptation of the manga, they couldn't, it, it, is, it would be difficult for them to be more different. You got to admire the willingness of people in the 80s to just go for it, even with unfinished yes. stories. And, They're and like, the people well, from we'll Game of Thrones should have paid more attention to how that <laughs> tended to happen. <laughs> No well, kidding. No, no, no. They, they, you see, yeah. the, they didn't care at the end. Yeah, there, there's a difference. <laughs> like this film, Otomo very clearly cared about it. But I will say, in terms of faithfulness, it's about as faithful as a Marvel movie is to the inspiring comic book. In that you've got characters, you've got roughly a same setting, but the stories they're telling are often very different, despite the tremendous yeah, that, amount the of MCU will setting similarities. Cherry pick fun elements from eight unrelated stories by eight different creative teams and add their own stuff to it where they inject it and assemble it together. It's that's more inspired by than adapted from. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what this movie feels like to the Akira manga. Not that I dislike the movie or the manga. I love them both. I'm just saying up front, they're different. Uh, uh, additionally, as far as for why they just went for it, it does help that this is '88. We are in the bubble economy. We are still in the Jap. We are still in the Japanese bubble. This is at the point where we are, where Japanese studios executives are like, "Hey, um, you guys who made this animated short for the for a science fiction convention for the opening ceremonies, um, cool. Here's a giant pile of money. Make a movie." And that's how you get Royal Space Force Wings of Honeyamis. What a time to be alive. That movie is so good and so not money making. You know, it, it, it absolutely tanked. And it and yet they went, oh, I, I appreciate what you did here. We're going to do this, give you another pile of money. And that's how you get Gunbuster. What a time um, to be alive. <laughs> And that and that leads to Hideaki Anno, uh, like his first really big director gig, directorial gig, and ultimately down the road leads to um, the us getting um, uh, Evangelion. In fact, actually, now that I look at it, uh, if I I believe that Gunbuster get can't started in '88, so it is contemporary, somewhat contemporaneous with this, with Akira. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, also doubly impressive considering if you look at the closing credits and all the animation studios who contributed to this um, Gynax is on there it's like they, they spared the band with like oh hey this Akira thing is going to be a big deal uh, let's um, let's talk, uh, chip in on that we want to be involved with that um, so um this is visually gorgeous. Um, in a lot of respect. Absolutely, there's. It is so influential. Like, I was reading the scene of Kaneda stopping his bike 
in a slide. Which may have been inspired by a seed in Lupin the Third. Which may have, but that is really close, is the most homage shot uh, in animation. Yeah, we watched a compilation. There, there was like a, 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 a compilation <laughs> of people just copying that one shot over and over and over again. Many, many projects. Uh, it's even gotten referenced in Nope by Jordan Peele. Fair enough. Um, and like also like the, the scene of uh, Canada kicking the guy off the motorcycle. Um, we got referenced a couple things as well. Buffy referenced it. Mm-hmm. Um, John Woo referenced it in Mission Impossible 2. Uh, it's amazing to look at this film in a sci-fi context. Um because like all of the the big sci-fi references like Blade Runner obviously but then going both forwards and backwards in time from this movie you can't disentangle it you know it has so many references and it creates so many more um, really a seminal sci-fi work I think it's also I in my opinion it is the my it is my gold standard I look at when I look at the psychic rampage in speculative fiction in broadcast speculative fiction um just talk about the plot um the premise of this is um go a bit more and more on this one um it is a post-apocalyptic cyberpunk juvenile delinquent story that ends up in psychic in, in a philosophical transcendentalism kind of um with a couple kids from a biker gang um shotaro kanada and tetsuro shima Tetsuo ends up in a motorcycle accident involving a psychic kid who was rescued, who was being rescued slash kidnapped from a research program. Um, ends up causing his own psychic powers to start to manifest. And he goes on a psychic rampage. And I'm heavily summarizing this because there is a lot going on. I was going to say, how long did it take you to condense that into a short paragraph? Like, you really have to... <laughs> This film is dense. Like, it packs in so much. And, like, there is... You can't... It's one of those films where it's hard to pull any scene from it without losing something from the whole. It, yeah, it's actually very tightly plotted. Yeah, it's very tight. Which you it's, have to in animation, because you don't have the money for extra <laughs> extra scenes. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is a two-hour film um, that is just so incredibly tightly plotted that it doesn't feel like a two-hour film, but every minute feels like it's contributing to the story as a whole. A lot of information to take yeah. in. Some of the yeah. gaps stood up to me more than the rest. To fill. I, I'm a sci-fi yeah. and fantasy fan. This is one that is as sci-fi as Star Wars is. The, these people have superhuman abilities, and there is no pretense of explaining what mechanisms they work, what rules they have by that it's a power and more power, and it's a result of experimentation and other effects. And that's it. So that was part of my issue with it when I saw it said at least 27 years ago, I know I was working in a movie theater. I can remember which co-worker recommended it to me. So I, I rented it. And we were working together from 95 to 97. So I know I saw it somewhere in that window. And then this was my second viewing. And I definitely appreciated it more here. Because uh, when he convinced me to watch it, really his description of it was not a very accurate picture. So this is one of those cases where you can have a perfectly good movie, but if you're expecting one thing and get another, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've been having this difficulty lately yeah. trying to explain to people why they have to watch Scavenger's Reign. <laughs> How do you decide? Yeah. Like, but it's, I mean, for contrast, oh, again, we're thinking back to my time in the theater, Deep Impact and Armageddon came out a few months apart. They are wildly different movies. If you go to one expecting the other, you're probably going to be dissatisfied, <laughs> even though you would appreciate it if you came in knowing what to expect. I, I don't think I could. I don't know what viewpoint it would take for me to appreciate Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> but this is actually an interesting point, though, for a lot of us American watchers of Akira, because I think a lot of us had that experience of 
like, you know, flipping through the TV and coming upon it. And, like, it's partially, what is this? And partially, like, this is so cool because the visual stylings are gorgeous. And, I mean, you got cool motorcycles, cool jackets, it's cool cyber The way the lights follow. The lights follow, yes. Oh, yeah, like, the, the lighting is... is, is the lighting effects are particularly great. And like the, the um, I sent both of you uh, a link to a making of documentary. Yes, you did. The film's release. And they talk about like the range of colors they're used for doing this. Um, and like, like with the lighting, like, so the night before we recorded this, I went to a professional wrestling event um, at, uh, in Portland. And one of the wrestlers there is a guy with name, whose ring name is by the name of evil Uno, who was wearing an Acura t-shirt. And I mentioned at the time, oh, hey, I'm doing a podcast about that tomorrow. And he said, hey, well, to somebody who's never, who hasn't seen it before or and or hasn't seen it in a long time. I said, hey, make sure to talk about the lighting. And I thought about that as, as after I'd taken my sheet and waiting for the show to start. I'm like, he's very much right. Like The lighting effects of this are dramatically different in a lot of respects from the way lighting is handled in lots of other works of animation. Even like big Western stuff like Disney and that sort of thing where they have similar... Um, like people with large amounts of experience in the craft of animation for the screen working for the uh, film screen working on this. Like it's it is. still the Most lighting Western feels very different animation in lots of when they create it, it's lit like a sitcom with what they call the high key lighting. So for those playing at home and don't know what the key light is the one next to the camera and parallel with the camera. If you have that turned up high, you eliminate shadows which is the way a lot of Western animation works, right? You don't see a lot of shadows on The Simpsons or on a Disney movie by default. You will have some scenes that are shadowed, but it's deliberate and mood setting and usually just for that one scene or that one setting. But this is more the low-key lighting. So it's lit without having that bright light by the camera. So this is lit more like a film noir, right? Those classic noirs from the 30s, the 40s, somewhere like The Maltese Falcon or The Big Sleep, where you do have <laughs> shadows in every frame. And even if it's just representing this, having the light and dark parts of the same jacket. So, you know, yes, the ca- the light is on their left and not on their right. And they even seem to have incorporated some of the, the shorthand. There was a convention established, I think by uh, Fritz Long in M 1931, the first film noir, fantastic movie, First German talkie, first lead role for Peter Lorre. The only movie I've ever seen where the tension is not, are the police going to get here in time? It's, do I want the police to get here in time? But again, another podcast. Um, But whether people are lit from the left or right was taken as a sign about whether or not they're telling the truth or not. And that was part of the mechanism, which again, seems to be showing up in this movie. So it's still a little hard again. Like I said, my expectations were not set correctly the first time I watched it. But this time it is, you can tell the story structure is adapting a manga where there's multiple volumes that are being chained into one story, right? It's like watching, I mean, one of the podcasts I have right now is a Babylon 5 podcast. Each episode has a beginning, middle, and end, but the whole thing is like a novel on television. So if you were to watch it in one continuous viewing, you'd have these weird ups and downs mm-hmm. in your rising action. It's not going up and up and up. it will be up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. There's a little bit of rising action. It's not the same. This has that too. There's a lot more peaks and valleys in the tension, which, I mean, I haven't read the manga. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I just had assumed some of that would be adapting a volume at a time and you say, okay, volume one wraps up here. Volume two wraps up here. Volume three wraps up here. It actually doesn't. The movie ends roughly at the end of volume two, sort of two and a half fish, because it the, the the vast majority of the anime is adapting bits that come from the first couple of volumes. But the single-handed biggest difference between the manga and what really the setting point is that in the manga, Akira is still alive. He is being sealed at 0.0005 Kelvin in that tiny thing. And Tetsuo and him are resonating with each other. And that's, and 
I had to ask David, like, one of the big kind of things that I was trying to parse as I was watching the movie, first time and second time, <laughs> um, is I was almost unconsciously trying to fit it into more of a hero's journey narrative because that's so prevalent, right? And I was like, my big question was, is Tetsuo some kind of chosen one or could it literally have been anyone? And like the drugs they were shooting him up with did all this to him, but it, it didn't have to be him. It could have been anyone. Yeah. The, the, um, and I still don't really have a satisfactory answer. <laughs> basically, is that anyone like with... It, it takes a while for the manga to really explain, but basically anyone who has like certain characteristics can have that effect. Like some are more, some will be more prevalent, some are others. The whole experiment was more of about triggering it and the whole program behind it. But one of the last bits is like at the very end of the manga is kind So anyone with the right metaclorian could have been kind you. of idea. <laughs> Yeah, sufficient. It, it's more of anyone who could base whose body would accept uh, the drugs I, and the treatments in a yeah. in a sufficient manner. But like, well, yeah, like in the end of the manga, well, not even the end. Like halfway through, Tetsuo sort of establishes himself as kind of this warlord, and one of the things he does is he's giving the drugs. He's putting the drugs in like all the food that he's get, handing out. And so basically trying to get as many people to have the quote-unquote power that he does. Also in very the manga... Very different character in the film. Very um, different character like in the film. Lady Miyako, who she doesn't get a name here. She's In the film, she's the leader of the Akira cultists. Uh, but in the film, in the manga, she's a radically different character. Yeah. Um, and like she's more in opposition to Akira. And, it prom- and the discussion there is more kind of a Buddhist... Um, enlightenment based way like hey there are this, you don't need the drugs to necessarily activate your psychic activate psychic powers in the sense of like a spiritual sense of spiritual enlightenment and that sort of thing a uh, very not necessarily a science versus um, tech um, versus spiritualism in opposition situation but more um, di- different approaches in the mindset because the Acura program, like, as we see in the movie itself, or um, that led to it, is a very like, kind of military, governmental focused. We're doing, we're creating psychics for the purposes of a our own governmental ends and our gain. Our, and, we mean, have gains by having psychics. Or I mean, let's be see, clear, they yeah. know this is a terrible idea. Yeah, they saw what happened before, and they were like, you know what, we're gonna do it again. <laughs> like that. That's <laughs> Like, it, it's really hard to watch the movie, and because I, I just finished my reread of the entire manga last night. Um, and the characters who are so different, because in the movie, the colonel, his, his motivations are a little unclear. It's like, okay, you're doing this, but why are you doing this? Yeah, he kind of chastises the scientist, like... You know, you got to keep this under control, man. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And the scientist is like, but science, and I must know what happens. <laughs> but then the colonel is like, no, this is fine. This is fine. Whereas, this is fine until it's really not. It's really not fun ever. <laughs> Whereas in the manga, he, does, he still starts this sort of very nebulous, why are you doing all of this that you're doing? But it's because he's a survivor of the original Akira, Akira incident. And he's, he basically gets the program restarted after it was shuttered uh, after, you know, World War Three, just to make sure that, because he knows Akira is going to be coming back. He wants a way to oppose him. Okay, that explains a lot. Yeah, it's, okay, I need, I need these weapons because this is going to happen again and I need to be able to stop it. There are some very kind of interesting pseudo sci-fi ideas about human evolution, forced evolution versus natural evolution, trying to stay on top of things you don't understand with technological progress. Like I, I wouldn't actually say that these are like 
themes of the film, but they are ideas that inform the film that are kind of baked into it. Um, you see them pop up in a lot of other media. Examining them in the context of Akira, though, it's almost like... <clears throat> I'm almost hesitant to do a deep read into any of these because I don't feel like that's what they were going for. Like, it's the movie is less about these uh, philosophical and science fiction ideas and more about what happens when you give yeah, them well, a street it, punk a that is power. That is a common uh, theme in a lot of the anime <laughs> I've heard and seen post-World War II, right? You're talking about the nation that has experienced nuclear warfare, right? They live through it. Yeah. So yes, the, that the theme of, very pointed. you know, tech gone too far, right? They know that people tested the nuclear weapons in Nevada. They had two of them dropped. They probably didn't need to drop the second one, but Hey, the, the test bomb at fat man, were based on uranium and little boy was based on plutonium. They didn't have a test bomb for that. So they nuked another city practically as a test bomb and to say we can do this again it's not a one-time fluke even though it was really just a two-time fluke but then the nuclear powers kept building meanwhile i could see the people in japan are going we are still dealing with the bomb you dropped a decade ago and you're building more and escalating i mean it's yeah in japan that whole like technology gone too far and people developing technology without really considering the implications is a common theme that shows up here. Whereas the implication we've seen for that in the Western world, like I think the, the mm -hmm. biggest side effect of the nuclear bomb in the Western animation is that SpongeBob and his friends live in bikini bottom, i.e. the bottom of the bikini atoll where they were testing it. That's why all these animals have been mutated and become sentient. It's because of the nuclear testing. That's the backstory that hasn't made the screen that the creator said in interviews. That's why it's Bikini Bottom. It's the bottom of the Bikini Atoll. That's why they can speak. Yeah. You know, my brain actually draw, draws a through line from the, the portrayal of the government officials in Akira all the way to the portrayal of government officials in the recent Shin Godzilla. There, <laughs> there is this this, um, you know, theme of incompetent, self-serving, corrupt government officials, uh, which in America we know a whole hell of a lot about these days. Um, yeah, and, these days. <laughs> especially these days. It's, um, it's not sadly, we have copycats. <laughs> it's, it's not. We're not in a happy place right now compared to 20 years ago. <laughs> So you look at the world of Akira and you think, okay, um, the average person is not doing great. You know, the infrastructure is uh, crumbling. You got these biker gangs everywhere, drugs readily available. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you get a narrow slice of it. So you don't know if it's just these kids or if everyone is living like this. But what we see of their society is not is not great. And then we see that their government officials are... Um, infighting at best, you know, corrupt and backbiting. And the one that looks like J. Janet Jameson. <laughs> and then the military leader like, orchestrates a coup and takes over, and obviously that's not any better. Um, it's an interesting comparison to Totoro, which is about kind of hope coming out of the post war period, where this is more like just exaggerating everything bad about it and dialing it up to 11 and, and then throwing in. <laughs> psychic tantrum teenager but <laughs> it is interesting with, with my watching this again because uh, between now between the last time i watched it now and this time i've read a lot more juvenile delinquent manga and watched anime adaptations thereof and like the plot line with um with tetsuo and kanada it's almost like they're, they're like they're right out like they are having their own juvenile delinquent manga storyline here until they literally run into the psychic um, science fiction government experimentation storyline. Like um, the manga Crows, which is a juvenile delinquent manga, and the recent manga and anime um, Windbreaker, uh, Windbreaker wrapped just this past year, um, or actually earlier this year, like their high school settings for those are like very, 
they are about as heavily graffitied up and that sort of thing um, as the high school that Tetsuo and, Kan and Kaneda go to. The difference, the main difference being is in um, Akira, the teachers are present and in Crows and uh, Windbreaker, they ver teachers very much are not. Um, there's a sense with um, from my understanding of the juvenile delinquent manga of this period that they have the teacher, like, um, and actually like um, Sukaban Deka actually fits into this as well, which is a uh, long-running Japanese juvenile delink female juvenile delinquent manga and had a live-action television series where with that, the teachers are very actively present and antagonistic forces of corrupt authority um, throughout that work, and the depictions of the instructors in the school are a lot of that, like after the kids get uh, the biker gang, except for Tetsuo, because he's off in a hospital somewhere, and our characters don't know where they, where they are, are brought back to school and chastised by the principal, they're then all like, punched in the face by the um, PE teacher. PE teacher. Uh, the, the, the dub that we watched, the original dub, it, he says, discipline, punch, discipline, punch. <laughs> and I was like, okay then. Yeah. Same in the Japanese version. <laughs> yeah, that's what they said. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is another one uh, that has two dubs. And from what I've seen online, there's, people are very split as to, as to which dub is the superior one. Uh, yeah, I personally prefer the second dub, the 2001 uh, Pioneer dub, with one sole exception. Uh, Tetsuo in that one is voiced by Joshua Seth, and he does a great job. But uh, he's, he, he was also Thai from Digimon. He that's Digimon. all I can hear every can't time he it. spoke. <laughs> but like, but it, whichever dub you watch, watch it with the subtitles on, because I do feel like some of the translations are poor or don't give you adequate information. <laughs> or sometimes the context is a little odd, so, <laughs> you know, the subtitle will give you some clarity on that. Yeah. Um, um, so what is which the default I on watch the, it with, uh, the copy that you so graciously sent, graciously sent me? Mm. Yes. Uh, is it the red cover one? Okay. Yeah. That that default is the two thousand. Yeah, that's the one we got. Okay. <laughs> uh, the default is the two thousand one Pioneer Dub. Or was it Genion? No, it was Pioneer. Two thousand. Yeah, but Pioneer, Pioneer, Genion are the same company. They are, but they switched. They they, 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 they changed. Yeah, it's really good cast for the for the the. Um, 2001 dub. You got uh, Johnny Young Bosch as Canada. Um, hey, Young, that's it's fairly early in his voice work too. Yeah, like he'd done Trigun by this point, but he hadn't like become like a big, like a really big acting name. So it's like, a real big break for him to like, hey, uh, Johnny. So you want to voice? We're redubbing re Akira. Do you want to voice one of the most iconic dub characters of all time? That's actually. That's one of the funny things about Kaneda, is his character is less iconic than his outfit and his bite. Yep. Like, he's very to the point that when I was watching it again for the first time almost 30 years later, I'd forgotten that, that he true. wasn't Akira. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. this and Rebecca are pretty unique in, in that respect. I don't know if you know Hitchcock's Rebecca, Best Picture Winner 1940. Uh, Rebecca's dead before the movie starts. The, the difference, but the main difference between them in that respect is that in Rebecca, uh, everybody knows it, and your the lead character is Rebecca's husband, widow's second wife, who feels she can't live up to the legend. I think, in addition to the gorgeousness of the of the visuals, one of the things that makes this movie so enduring is that you can draw comparisons to it and therefore pair it with many, many other films. Like if you want to pair it with other psychic rampage films, it'd be interesting to watch it with Carrie, for instance. Um, if you wanted to pair it with uh, another story, not necessarily an 80s story, but there were plenty of 80s stories about young people living in a society that their elders have ruined, struggling against forces, you know, and authorities. Uh, I, I think it's interesting, like, when the evil science slash military division, whatever, scoops um, Tetsuo off the street, there's just no blink in an eye. There's like, yeah, 
No one's going to miss this kid. We will turn him into our next guinea pig. Sure, why not? And then, you know, Connie Dust spends, like, the first third of the film trying to do that uh, kind of juvenile delinquent loyalty to your gang thing where he's like, we got to go find him, you know? And Tetsuo doesn't appreciate this because he's always felt like the low man on the totem pole, which apparently went right over Connie's head. Uh, <laughs> That's the thing. I thought I was helping you. You thought I was just looking down on you. <laughs> So classic miscommunication. Uh. Uh, it's it's also interesting, like relating to the the um, juvenile delinquent side of things, where how this like the juvenile delinquent aspect of this, how the humor comes into the story, um, like with Canada, like half picking, trying to pick up uh, K um, at various points of the story, and constantly blundering into these really intense dark um, <laughs> violent situations we're getting shot uh, at but this is clearly a great time for flirting <laughs> yep um we're like so oh clueless, we, this kid. Like, he, he, he rescues uh, Kay from these like uh cops and she shoots and kills one of them she's clearly traumatized by the fact that she's killed someone for the first time mm -hmm. and he's like so yeah you great you time to hit on you you killed somebody you can go to prison and purify your soul but i'll be waiting for you when you come out baby um uh, I read and this as partially counted as a dumbass, but also no, yes, too many men. Just like this. No offense, fellas. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 uh, like also, there's like the bit like later on in the movie when after we get the first of uh, the soul orbital laser attack uh, that happens, where like the debris is coming back down and Canada is dodging the. Desperately dodging the debris in a way that almost feels like you could insert some Hanna Barbera or Warner Brothers sound effects in there, um, but both with just the, the spatial expressions and that sort of thing. Maybe the Tetris soundtrack. <laughs> I think you did that for me. Yeah. So, so <laughs> how, <laughs> how did you feel about how it handled the uh, tonal elements there in terms of the? Uh, the ways in which it tried to insert comedy, uh, comedy, like also like with like the scene with the your bikes on fire. Uh, so <laughs> that <wow>. was great. <laughs> I think they definitely needed those moments. Yeah, um, I think they were handled well. Uh, I think they were very needed because levity in this film is. It's not yeah, this is things. not a comedy. <laughs> when you when you're laughing out loud, the jokes aren't that funny. It's just here's a pressure valve for you. Go. Yeah. Just really Which is good. It's, yeah, it's necessary. This is actually my second Oof. podcast today. And the first podcast was about a Hitchcock film that Hitchcock regretted making because there was no humor. And it, it, I confess. Which one? Mm. Um, so, uh, but speaking of the tension stuff, this is a film that's also very well known for its use of violence and very graphic violence in it as well, which like there had been R or NC-17 mm -hmm. rated animated films at this time. I think this came out after Fritz the Cat, um, but it's radically different in a lot of respects, both in terms of the level of violence and how well animated it is. And so um, how did you feel both your first time watching it and then now at handling it, at how it handles this level of violence. Well, I think the first time I saw it, which was with TV edits, was still holy shit. <laughs> um, but it, it does them really well. Like the first, like ultra violent scene you see is when Tetsuo's guts all fall out. But that's all in his head. You can see him trying. And it doesn't, it, 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 it well does, it's like everything in the film, beautifully hand animated. And, but it does go to show that it's, it's, what am I trying to say here? It's handling it well, and it's not pulling punches. Like, it's not doing it for the sake of, oh, we're going to make this. Super gross, super violent, super gutsy. Uh, just to have it that it's it's all still telling part telling part of the story. And 
Honestly, my reaction is could have been worse. <laughs> could have been some really horrific motorcycle crashes that we didn't get. Uh, <laughs> people getting shot a lot. But honestly, I was kind of desensitized to that, even as a kid, from watching 80s movies. People got shot a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel like the body horror element stuck with me yeah, a lot more. I had a, a similar feel. The body horror yeah. was more mm. familiar because... Probably because in a lot of ways, the way it's framed is more visceral. And it's also much less common in the media, as you said. Like, you could find lots of movies where people are getting gunned down. Not as much body horror. But as David said, even though there is a lot of it, it does not feel gratuitous in the context of the story they're telling. Right. Thank you. That's the word I was trying to find gratuitous. It was not. It was grounded in the world of the story. Like, the, the scene where Kay shoots uh, one of the guards and loses, like, half his face is treated by her certainly, and ignored most of the comment, which is cute girl, but it's treated as, like, this horrific act that she's never done before, and it's, oh my god, so it, it shows the characters' differing reactions to violence mm-hmm. appropriately, I think. Yes. Honestly, in that scene, I'm more freaking out about what the hell is in that water. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, my OCD was, like, flipping out. Water <laughs> should be that color. Oh, you yeah. found it in your mouth. Oh, God. Yeah, the, 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 the second, like, uh, not the second time, like, the like one of the times I watched the movie, this is around the time where Rift Tracks has was doing a thing on their site where you could submit your own um, for for sale like homemade Rift Tracks tracks. Mm-hmm. But, oh, I will try to coming up with some jokes and doing that for Akira. And there was a point where I like, got that scene in the movie. I was kind of like improvising, and the guy gets shot like, and like oh he's like shot through one cheek and out the other. That's that's technically survivable. As he falls, the like, nope nope not anymore. <laughs> um, Goodbye. <laughs> that, that 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 went septic immediately. Uh, um, but you guys can't I, see I, this, I, but I'm like full body shuddering over here. Um, but Sorry, yeah, like, this is more me than any read of the movie. Uh, like the, the body horror, like I every, every time I've watched it, it's really got kind of gotten me, uh, gotten me like the, the moment that stuck out in my brain in various respects, whether it's, um, like Tetsuo trying to like recon, like when he loses an arm partway through the movie, reconstitute his, like make, make a psychic construct arm. And both just the original, the first, both first, both how that forms, and then when it stops, when it no longer fits in, just goes under his control. It starts like embedding itself in his stone throne oh. chair thing, which is crazy. That is one of the things. Like, there's a lot of things that they don't bother to explain in the movie because to tell the story they're telling, they don't need to. But I did appreciate their explaining what was going on there in the manga. Which is to say, Tetsumo's power is outgrowing his body. And it's desperately trying to pull more... It's trying to get other stuff to basically ex- be able to expand itself. Which is one reason he starts exploding, is because his power just keeps... I mean, that climax, though, is, is just... I- Climbing. It's a lot. Like for me, it was the fact that he's screaming the entire time that he is. Oh, and begging for help. Yes, yeah, screaming and begging for help. The the way that they animated that, I can't. You know, you can't even really describe it. You just you know it when you see it referenced in other things, um, and it's horrifying. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's a reason to this day they still call that sort of body horror going Tetsuo. Mm. Yeah, uh, it is. Um, as far as like, like oh, oh, one thing to note that interesting is like so Tetsuo like as a first name it basically means kind of like person of iron. So it's also an interesting term from, from a character writing standpoint. Tetsuo is a very emotionally fragile person, and that really carries out throughout the story. Where um, he's like he starts out he's like very much trying to compensate for what he feels for his insecurity. Uh, him kind of seeking to uh, aspire to have kind of this bike at multiple points, which goes badly for him the second time. Uh, it goes badly for him and for uh, Kyrie. 
the second time. And oh then <laughs> and then that kind of ultimately is what sets the psychic rampage off is is um like, him like okay, I have the power to be the, the, the person I to, to have the strength that I believe I should have. Um There's a lot of those interesting anime ideas about strength that are carried through there but also the the movie is just really dripping in traditional patriarchal masculinity um which is partially the function of its time and partially the function of it's a story about a biker gang so that yeah yeah comes with the territory but the treatment of movie in this women or of women in this movie is particularly interesting um because you have k and Kaori are, are interesting foils to each other, just like Kaneda and Tetsu are interesting foils to each other. And I feel like ultimately the movie is about powerlessness. Everyone is powerless in one form or another. Tetsuo's perceived powerlessness, um, the way he goes mad with power after he gets a taste of it, but he's still unable to save himself in the end. The government's powerlessness to do anything to better their own society the military general's powerlessness to control this power that he helped unleash. Um, you know, it's just an interesting uh, lens through which to view every single character, because I think every single character can be examined in terms of their helplessness to what they're going through. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> like, that... I, I, I did say, like, power and powerlessness are... Absolutely huge things in this, um, in this movie. Uh, less so in the manga, where it's less about power and it's more about both control and balance. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but that's the manga, and we're talking about the anime. Like there will absolutely be comparisons, but well, and I think those two themes arise out of the discussion of power and powerlessness as mm-hmm. well. Like they're kind of logical extension. The movie doesn't really have time it's to streamline. Yeah. Um, Again, what, yeah, this what is mostly as a product of the era. The female characters were not as well developed as the rest, right? Again, it's like we're talking about in the, the total role part. Mm-hmm. They are more the archetypes plugged in to fill the role than the characters with depth. That is also true of a lot of the male characters. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, it's only a small percentage of the cast that actually get depth. It's just that they're all male in that small percentage. So you get some of that and they, you know, they'll have those lines that establish which archetype they're filling early on. In most cases, it's, you know, and some of it I can see it. I think there's more of the, the silent stoic hero seems to be more of a thing in the Japanese culture than here. Um, you know, we see that again. You know, in the video game fandoms for the the fans of Squall in Final Fantasy VIII, who is my least favorite FF lead character. But yeah, that is um, a correct assumption. He is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the number of games, I would agree. Game if you're talking the whole franchise, there's no contest. All the bravest is the absolute bottom of the barrel. Um, it, it's the mobile game that has no strategy or anything. Okay, um, of the but, number, yes. Yeah. You know, speaking of archetypes, it's interesting that you could consider this film um, a film without mm-hmm. a hero. Uh, it has protagonists, certainly, but it, it's questionable whether you could call Kanye a hero or not. Um, I think mm-hmm. the movie kind of positions him as one for the ease of storytelling. Mm-hmm. But it also shows you that he's definitely a flawed individual, and he's young. He's been let down by his society and culture, his education system. Um, but he also yeah. embraces that and chooses it, as opposed to trying to better himself. Uh, and so his virtue is kind of like his loyalty to his friend, but at the same time, he's also not emotionally aware enough to see that his friend... Yeah, and on top of that, when we meet our lead characters, like they're involved in a gang war. Right, this is you know they they are not heroes yep. in the traditional sense, and I feel like okay, yeah, they were kind of margin. They were criminals at the start, not serious criminals, right? They're not serial killers. They're not really organized crime, 
but they're not playing by the. Yeah, so it, it's yeah, not. But they're totally is, fine with murdering. Rival you know, they're not good, necessarily okay. good people. And by the time it's all said and done, <laughs> I don't see anything that says that they regret that part of their path. There's specific instances, but it feels like if Tetsuo hadn't happened to be the guy who hit the psychic kid with his bike, and if it was a member of the other gang, then the story would have been about that gang instead. Right? There's nothing intrinsic with these people that says that they had to be involved. I think, like David said, okay, in the manga they established it. In the movie, I just felt like Tetsuo was the one they experimented on because he was the one that hit the kid on his bike. Yeah. He was there. Yeah, he was there. <laughs> exactly. Like, that is something, is that after the events, r- after roughly when the events conclude in the movie, you do see there the factions of the bike gang sort of go away, and Joker, the head of the clowns, basically becomes one of Kaida's strongest allies in the world they're living in, after the changes that are made. And they're not friends by any means, but they are kind of ride or die for each other. <laughs> like, Joker comes in, essentially that, you know, gunship cavalry. He, he's the one who gets that. It's not common. So, so does, it, does it become kind of a delinquent, you could actually save our culture kind of story, or not? not? No, it's more of a, <laughs> the differences that we had aren't really worth the violence we've inflicted upon each other. So just it's the events of the movie just changed the context. Thing. Also worth noting that didn't didn't really make it into Yeah. Yeah, also- no, it doesn't change. That's the that's the point. These uh she used to weird else along they're young they're young, dumb and ugly. <laughs> and apparently drug users, but the movie doesn't really make that clear. Yeah, like that's the reason they're the capsules, that's why they're gay, is they're always going out into fights high. They're taking dr- like that's why they were in the bars. That's their supplier. They were picking up drugs to take before they went to fight the other gangs. Yeah. This is one of the instances where um, art details from the manga help embellish things a bit further. So, in the manga, there is additional detail around the back of Kanada's vest, a uh, jacket. Um, in the anime, it just has the capsule. In the manga, it has the words "good for health." bad for education written around it in English. Um, I don't kind of, for not wanting to put that in every scene. <laughs> well, also, like, also like from an animation standpoint, that would have to be play hell for keeping track for, for continuity. Yeah. Um, and it might not show up as well on the big screen anyway, so this might fall, that would fall in the category of this detail. Yeah, that seems we like will the spare kind of our animators a little, a, a, a little anxiety on this one. And- not what the world was ready for in 1988. Today you could do it because then you could wrap the texture and then it stays, the computer keeps it consistent and the humans don't have to. If it's being done by hand, that's just, the the investment versus return yeah. is not good on that. The worst. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Um Speaking of the animation no, for this, um, no, um, I mentioned that the documentary. Were you able to watch the documentary? Going out of town uh, tomorrow Blaine? to a water park two hours away, and this is my second of four podcasting appointments this weekend, so I have not watched extras for any of them. Careful. Fair enough. <laughs> so one of the things they did with animating this is they animated it on, I believe they animated it on the ones. Um, which is what they do a lot for Western animation, but rarely do for Japanese animation. Um, and they also did the animation for the characters after doing the voice acting to make sure that the voices match up to the, um, like the lip movements match identically with the voice acting. Um, there's actually some really good, um, in fact, I will link to the video, the documentary, because this one I'm thinking of in particular is on YouTube, um, in the show notes. But there is a really good um, some footage of one of the voice acting recording sessions for one of the scenes, and then with the actors, and then with the not with not like the final animation, but with like the um, uh, keyframes, not um, non inked cell animation um, for comparison. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, it did that. 
Um, we talked about soundtrack for Toto. Let's talk about the soundtrack for this as well. Um, so when I started getting into soundtrack due to vinyl collecting and anime soundtracks in particular, the first one I wanted was the soundtrack to Akira because it's so very different from a lot of other soundtracks in general. And at the time, it was not available on uh, vinyl. It did come out later, and I did pick it up. Um, but like, this is a really different and engaging score. Uh, it does use a lot of like traditional instruments, along with percussion and lots of interesting choral work. I was hearing taiko um, drums, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, taiko yeah. drums, um, other percussion, um, lots of interesting choral stuff. The soundtrack is by... I have to look at the, the name, so I make sure I pronounce it correctly. Uh, it's recorded by Ginyo, um, Yamash uh, Ginyo Yamashiro Gumi, um, which is a uh, music collective, and like really interesting use of like like they do find ways in spite of the instrumentation they are because even with the instrumentation and vocals they're using to come up with interesting themes, like there's the main theme of uh, the kind of the theme which they use at the start of the bike um, chase and over the closing credits. And then, like, when they introduce the clown gang theme, which uses, like, like deep breaths and wheezing sounds as a sort of percussive riff thing. And then, like, as they get into the, the big confrontation between uh, Joker and Kanada, they, like, interweave the Kanada theme and the um, clown gang theme in really interesting and fun ways. And there's plenty of other stuff there throughout the movie. Um, what did you? I think it works think about well the in the doing score. the job a score is supposed to do. Right, it's not necessarily, at least not in all cases. It doesn't have to be something that you want to just listen to in isolation, but it should accent the film in ways that guide but don't dictate emotions. Right, it should be resonating with the emotions you're feeling anyway because of the story, but not trying to put those emotions in you. So it's okay if you don't really notice it in a moment when aside from the fact that it's playing as long as it's not conflicting with it. Right? A really good score, it's okay if it sometimes fades completely into the background. Right? There's some movies people don't realize how little music they're actually hearing. Right? Star Wars is known for having a score through most, you know, having a huge amount of score relative to the screen time, but the Star Wars score is still only like 60% of the screen time. 40% of it has no background music, at least. And I think this is, you know, it's similar. So the, the score hits it. I haven't tried to listen to it in isolation. It might be totally enjoyable there. But watching the film, it didn't stand out in a good or bad way for me. It just fit with the piece. I agree that it does really fit. Um, beautifully does what a score is supposed to do. Alex, you talked about the late motifs a little bit, which are like the themes for particular characters or moments. Um, really good use of late motifs in this score, especially like the choral chanting that you mentioned um, that comes in for like the kind of creepy supernatural elements that are happening. I liked that um, there was such a varied use of percussion, I think you mentioned in the score, and it is used to put you on edge at times, like Blaine said, but things were already, you know, meant to be suspenseful and on edge. The percussion just highlights that and that they don't stick with one style of percussion. They use a bunch of different ones. I think it was really cool instrumentation. Um, yeah, I, I also I mentioned like this is my kind of like my standard I compare works to for um, psychic rampages like so I was going to consider me sending this in for a feedback episode but I wanted to podcast about this with you first and want to spoil it for you like uh, I remember when I watched the Babylon Five episode Mind War from season one which has already been covered on the Babylon Five podcast I will link to that episode in the show notes um, as the, I look at psychic rampages I, I look at how like the scene from Akira, like from how it's done in Akira, go, okay, within the limitations of the medium that are doing their own psychic rampage, um, in terms of both budget and content restrictions based on platform, how well does it get that sense of, um, like, in particular, like, Kanada's ramp, uh, Tetsuo's rampage has a sense of loss of control to it. Even when he's actively lashing out, 
consciously, it's there's still a sense of he doesn't quite, uh, he's not really totally in control of what he's doing and leading to the exercising of more power than he perhaps he intends, but him putting up a front of that. And I think about in, like, like in particular, there's a bit at the start of the rampage when Tetsuo is out of his, is broken out of his room and he kills those first two guards. And Just with, bam. With, like, like, like <laughs> gestures away and he, he does this like swiping motion to, 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 to gesture them away. And it's a very casual motion at you, like just a, a general go away motion. And it has such a catastrophic impact that I got to say, I've always had a sense when I see that, that what happens isn't what he actually intended to have happen, but it just did. And he's in a situation where, because he's in a place he's being held against his will, he's kind of rolling with it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I like look at, for example, the Batman 5 episode Mind War, when we have Jason Ironheart running in that episode running into problems with his psychic powers and losing control. Um, I got a vibe of that. Like, I don't know if JMS was consciously referencing Akira at, the, at, at that point. Um, I, I, I can certainly see it being in the background radiation of science fiction at that point. Um, and that coming up in there. Because also, Jason Ironheart and Tetsuo, in a weird way, end up kind of in the same ultimate result but in different in different ways tetsuo does ultimately transcend physically as does ironheart though ironheart's transcendence is dramatically less destructive yeah. <laughs> than it for tetsuo helped by the ironheart fact that was able to get into space that, that that definitely helps also also like yeah. Considering how the Babylon um, Project yeah, stations the go, B5 that connection. Jason Ironheart could have been where Babylon Five went. Bad. Will never do a conscious <laughs> story reference. He might reference respected creators, such as naming the psychic Bester after Alfred Bester, who created the Demolished Man, and it was one of the B Five tie-in novels where they recognized what he was referencing and gave the B Five character the first name Alfred. He was just Mister Bester before that, and then they started using Alfred on the the series in season three, I believe, um, which we're recording now. So yes, the releases are late. Yeah. Love to they that. explicitly call him Alfred in the one we recorded about la the one we recorded about like a week or two ago. So I'm confident they don't call him Alfred. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I, I recently watched Code Geass for the first time. Revolution of the Revolution. I, um, I have no idea how I missed this when I was younger. It just completely skipped by me. I could have seen myself being kind of obsessed with it when I was younger. Um, you did love the clip. But the, the main character has a point where he loses control of his psychic powers at the worst possible moment that leads to a massacre by the most good-hearted character on the show. And from that point, everything is like, oh, crap, like the series does a complete spiral from there <laughs> into disaster. And um, yeah, that, that makes me think of this as well. <laughs> you don't want to lose control of those yeah. powers. <laughs> so I suppose I'd say we recommend the films. But... Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like this this was a like truly like I think it was kind of I I absolutely get with every watch how this was a formative work in the rise of American anime fandom. Also helped by the fact like to a certain degree why this grabbed hold more than say Totoro did at the time is Akira got a theatrical release. Um, it has contemporary reviews from like the Washington Post. Now I dug up the Washington Post review from uh, a link to it on IMDb. And the Austin awesome Post review by Richard Harrington, I'm going to name and shame because he missed because he misnames Katsuhiro Otomo. He names him Katsuhiro Otomoto, which um That's a man's basic name. fact check. Yeah, come on, man. Look look at look at the poster when you left the theater. Okay, okay, okay. That's on the editor. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's shared blame on that one. Yes. The fact that it made print is on the editor. Okay, fair. 
<laughs> um, but like it's got like really solid review. Like it was really strongly reviewed at the time. They didn't completely like they ran into some similar problems with the plot. Uh, as far as with the the over density and losing track of some things, but like um, it got a good review from uh, Harrington Ebert and uh, Statistical Ebert had it as one of their video picks in 1991 when it came, when it came out for home video. Uh, they um, the the Harrington review does say um, this is probably not a good film for yeah, anyone it, under explicit. twelve. Yep, yeah, um, you had to point yeah, out stuff like this the, back then. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, yeah, in fact, still do. Yeah, that was so definitely a, a bigger percentage percent, of the population yeah, making that assumption. There's less of an assumption, assumption nowadays that cartoons back then. for kids. So yes, <laughs> this is one. To this day, if I if I were writing the review, I would still mention that because yeah, uh, like David said, I would also recommend both of these films, just not necessarily to the same audience. Yeah. The, yeah. Akira is recommended to a much narrower audience than Totoro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and yet you can draw some, you can draw some interesting comparisons between them. <laughs> uh, they, they, are, they are definitely, again, they are probably to pick them as they're very interesting thematic contrast that came out the same year. Um, what, like the, the look at how these whole held up, um, on, for, for the 99 years, 100 film podcast of Blaine's, we, uh, he does runs downs of, um, how these films of, are perceived now through Letterboxd and IMDb and like of the uh, IMD of uh, Letterboxd of the top films of 1988, um, Grave of the Fireflies is number one. But then, like the next anime film behind it, is Akira, with the only films in between being Cinema Paradiso, which is like one of uh, the, the most beloved films of Italian cinema, and Landscape in the Mist, which I admit I have never heard of. Um, the Greek looks like it's a Greek film. Um, foreign film um and then totoro right behind akira and i i get I, I absolutely see that because totoro did not get like it was on home video but i totoro feels like the film that while both of these may have been misshelved in the animation section back in the day once video stores started having the special interest foreign film section akira would have moved right over to the, the special interest foreign film section while totoro would have stayed in the children's films and that can sometimes lead to a movie getting a degree of popular um, ghettoization in terms of the, the artistic merits of, of a film as a work of cinema. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I definitely get that there. So um, uh, pulling how, up the IMDb I wasn't able to pull up the, the IMDb right. How did that fare? How did, uh, for titles that have at least 10,000 votes, because otherwise you get some stuff where it's like six people have seen it and five of them are the director's family, so they all gave it high ratings. Um so with a minimum 10,000 votes, the number one film of the year is Grave of the Fireflies. Number two is Cinema Paradiso. Three is Die Hard and four is My Neighbor Totoro. Akira comes in at number eight. So there's Time of the Gypsies, a short film about love, and Rain Man in between. So. Okay. By contrast, I'm looking for Rain Man on um, uh, Letterboxd. Like, Die Hard comes first. Yeah, the Letterboxd, um, isn't, it doesn't have the text, so you can't even just hit Control F. Bit of a pain. Covers. You have to go through and recognize uh, the movie poster they are using. I, I tend to prep that for our podcast in advance by doing the search for all the titles and saying, okay, what poster are you using? Let me go find that. What poster yeah. are you using? Let me go find that. But yeah, like it's taking a bit b before I find it, but like we, I am seeing like other anime films before it, like the uh, Legend of the Galactic Hero, the first Legend of Galactic Heroes movie is above it, and Rofu and Roger Rabbit is above it. Um, so Rain Man did not fare as well um, on uh, Letterboxd. So that is interesting. So yeah. Um, and like, as a person on the autism spectrum, I have an axe to grind against uh, Raid Man for its depictions of people yeah, we, who, are, who are autistic. So I'm okay with that. 
lot of spreading of misinformation. That, that film did a lot of it, Yeah, it was Best Picture for 1988. <laughs> I, so just the, I think that means it's the one like due for release in December. Yeah, yeah. 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 Here in July, we're releasing Terms of Endearment from 83. So it'll be December or January, depending on whether that... I'm trying to remember if that year was for the movie or the, the release. The next one we're recording is Forrest Gump, because we're ahead of schedule, because that's the way I work. Yeah, um, but yeah. So looking at this, I'm like, yeah, I would put Akira and uh, Totoro, and for that matter, Who Framed Roger Rabbit and uh, Die Hard, uh, well above Rain Man in my book. Um, yeah, well, well, like I said, we'll we'll get to that. Probably also, Last Temptation of Christ would probably have been a better contender for best the reason picture. Why our That's our podcast. Recording tomorrow should be so interesting because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I, mean, I do think I do think Totoro gets slept on in comparison to Akira because Akira gets brought up a lot um, in terms of you know film film history, the history of genres within film, and just as a work that influenced countless other works in many other genres. Uh, everyone knows about Totoro, but I feel like most people haven't sat and watched it. Part of that is probably because. It is a film more for children, and so I think it's kind of a harder sell for adults who aren't really invested in uh, Miyazaki films. Especially adults who aren't necessarily parents. Yeah. I can see parents who are like, or people who are into Miyazaki, and like, oh yeah, I yeah, love Porco Rosso, I, I, I love, I, I'll, I'll go watch Spirited Away, but I, Totoro, I'll get around to it eventually. Yeah, I, I would also I'm not, I'm say not that prepared to say it's one of the things I learned working in the theater for three years, the the there are two kinds of family films. <laughs> There's your toy stories, which truly are all ages. You could ask anyone coming out, how was it? And everyone will say, no, that was great. And then there's some other films I will choose not to name here, where families are coming out. You say, how was it? The kids are going, that was great. And the parents are smiling through gritted teeth going, the kids really enjoyed it. Right. This is more in the Toy Story line, where yes, it might be marketed for children, but it does have all ages appeal. It's not one of those films that's going to insult the adults in the audience as they're watching it, which is so true of, you know, how many movies are we up to in the Air Bud franchise? The first was okay. Um, and, and speaking of huge franchises, uh, going through this list now, David, uh, we had a conversation earlier, which I don't remember if we had it before or after recording. The highest rated movie of the year from the Western world that was absolutely marketed directly at children is The Land Before Time. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The theme song from that, that became CD our grad song because that, we went yeah, to a secular public that. school. <laughs> the staff were eliminating like we're here for a good time, not a long time. And any pop music that had any reference to drugs whatsoever. Yeah. So when it came time to vote, we had the theme from the land before time and five hymns and not being a Christian school land before time <laughs> won by a wide margin. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was, it's like the, uh, yeah, it's like the the, the red right, dwarf yeah, script book. books. Yeah. They don't call them the best scripts. They call them the oh, least worst no. scripts. Run <laughs> Before Time theme was the least worst song on the ballot. The least worst scripts. <laughs> uh, my high school was Seasons of Love from Rent for our graduation song. Is that a graduation song? Um, we went to a Catholic high school, so I think they just did pomp and circumstance. What happened? Yeah. Um, yes, we did go to high school together. That's where we met. <laughs> yeah, that's so. That was a fun game. We definitely recommend both these, uh, both of these films to for very different audiences. Um, next month. We will be uh, covering another seminal work of, anim of anime cyberpunk, Bubblegum Crisis, because August is um, 
is the month of Gen Con, so we like to pick anime that are have some sort of tabletop role playing connection. And uh, Bubblegum Crisis received a table licensed tabletop role playing game from Our Talzorian Games, the people who made Bekton, um Teenagers from Outer Space, and, Cy and Cyberpunk, which recently adapted to the Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven video game. Yes. So that's something to look forward to for next month. Uh, in the meantime, um, um, for all those of my who podcasts you, can be found um, at Bureau Forty Two dot com. Who have I have three you, actively uh, running podcasting right now. Where can they find you? Um, two of which have, we've already mentioned. So there's Babylon Five Thirty Years Later, where John and Wilson and I go through an episode of Babylon Five and we release those podcasts thirty years after the original broadcast date. That's our release schedule. Our recording schedule is about two seasons ahead of that right now. Uh, it is safe for first-time viewers, Garing. Uh, no, the the gathering aired in 92. Yeah, February 92. And, and then uh, Midnight on the Firing Line that launched it was January 1993. Deep Space Nine was already on the air. Um, so we, the, the times where we're skirting that 30 years later, we covered the gathering the week before Midnight on the Firing Line, so we wouldn't have an 11-month gap between our first two episodes. And then um, after we get through Crusade, we're going to take all the direct-to-video releases and compress them into a weekly cycle. Nice. So it is John's first time through, so guaranteed safe for first-time viewers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ooh, first time. Okay. Well, uh, uh, we are. Yeah, we're we're doing those on broadcast dates. So they were originally produced um, as jumping on and marking points for the people who were watching the first four seasons in reruns. So they would have like in the beginning, they aired right before the reruns on TNT hit season one, and then the next movie was right before the they hit season two and so forth. Yeah. But yeah, so we're doing it everything like, except for those the post crusade stuff and the gathering is thirty years after release. Yeah. Um, another show we've already mentioned is the ninety nine years one hundred films when Trey Hooks and I go through every winner of the Best Picture Academy Awards. So we started with Wings, and the and Sunrise, and since then, on the twenty eighth of the month, every month we have gone through a Best Picture winner. So by the time the podcast ends we will have gone through the first 100 winners and unless they change the Oscar ceremony schedule, that last episode should drop just before the ceremony at the 100th Oscar ceremony. Um, and then the other one I have um, is an old time radio show where I just take old time radio shows. I want to listen to myself and upload them and release them in podcast form. Cause that's how I consume things. I don't just sit at my computer and listen, but if it's in a podcast, I can do it when I'm driving or whatever. Um, so we've done, the, it's on season five now. The first two seasons were Dimension X and X minus one, which are sci-fi shows. Then I did Duffy's Tavern, created by the father of one of the creators of Cheers. And you can see a lot of Cheers DNA in Duffy's Tavern. You can see where they got that from, especially the season one Cheers. Uh, and then we did Pat Novak for Hire. And right now I'm actually jumping from show to show doing um, adaptations of things that Hitchcock also adapted. Sometimes they're adapting the Hitchcock version. Sometimes they just use the same source material before Hitchcock. So it's a, a different story. So, yes, those are the three current shows. And then I've got, I think, 24 shows that have wrapped up in podcasting since 2012. All right. Cool so. stuff. And I'll have links to that in the show notes as well. So, again, next month we will be uh, watching Bubblegum Crisis, which is streaming almost everywhere last time I checked because of the company that licensed it, uh, that handled the streaming rights. They <coughs> sub to lots of other companies, so you can watch it on Peacock. You can watch it on Tubi, like more or less internationally on Tubi. Um, it's on Crunchyroll. It's everywhere. It also got a very nice Blu-ray release. Which, um, uh, which I by Animigo, which I kickstarted, and so I have that. Um, it's all um, they've they've sold out since, since sold out of the Kickstarter release, so they're doing a they've done a new release since then. So that's 
So there's also that. And that will be discussed about then. We'll also talk, maybe may talk a little bit about the tabletop <laughs> role-playing game um, as well. Great. So, have In that. Conclusion. <laughs> yep, so look forward to that next uh, next month. And if you enjoyed what you heard, if you're watching, listening to this on the YouTube version, uh, please consider liking, subscribing, and commenting. Um, if you get your comments in before the next episode, we'll um, throw read those on air. Also, please consider emailing at animeexplorations at gmail.com. That's or animeexplorationspod at gmail.com. Um, that's with two E's. Uh, and please, if you like want to financially support and handle our hosting costs, please consider backing our Patreon at patreon.com slash count zero or for a um patreon backers get access to lots of my other stuff um like up to a week in advance we also have a i also have a kofi as well that's ko-fi.com slash count zero if doing the whole monthly subscription thing doesn't fit with your budget uh, and you just toss it some thank cash you in the jar. uh thank you all very much for watching and we will be back next month Thank you. Thank you so much.